So I need to explain that this paper is on inequalities and it's in the United States. And uh, actually the scope of the paper is much broader in the sense that it's about inequality certainly, but it's also our interpretation of uh, what's going on in the United States and indirectly in the world, in the rest of the world, uh, in terms of distribution of income, but also in terms of broader transformations. This book is borrows very much from earlier works, and in particular, the last book that we published here, Managerial Capitalism. This book was published by Pluto Press in London. Normally, we publish our book with Harvard University Press. We already have two big books with Harvard, and we are trying to finish another huge book on macroeconomics that I will probably present here if I survive during the following years because we, the contract was signed in uh, 2013 and we are still working very intensely on it. I hope we will finish. So <coughs> this book, why Pluto? Because Pluto asked us, okay? They asked us really to write a book on this, to on this topic and so we said yes, which was a bad idea actually. <laughs> but it was published because they are not very good, okay? But uh, but it was published, don't repeat it. But uh, so the why focus, the focus on inequality precisely, this is due to a conference in Utah, in Salt Lake City, the great Salt Lake City. And uh, this was a big conference with a lot of money uh, and uh, a, with Joseph Stiglitz, who was the main speaker there. And uh, the th theme of the conference was on inequality. So we prepared a paper, which is not this paper, but the previous one. But back to France, I decided to write a new version with new curves and new, it's about the same story, but we present it in a way that we consider as more convincing. The contact with Stiglitz in Salt Lake City was excellent and we had the opportunity to discuss this paper, not this one, but the previous one. And uh, Stiglitz made a long presentation because this was the opening lecture. And he spoke about inequality with the data about inequality. And he gave interpretations, his own interpretations. This is a type of interpretation of the rise of inequality that prob you probably know. And it's in term, it's very neoclassical in our language, okay? Or very mainstream in terms of market power, in terms of monopoly, of rents. And we think we completely disagree with this type of interpretation. Stiglitz disagree with Piketty's interpretation in the book. Everybody dis disagree with Piketty's interpretation in the book now. And uh, so he has this type of interpretation. But after speaking more than one hour, what happened was the following. Piketty, uh, Stiglitz was explaining, you know, rents, uh, lack of competition in the US economy and so on. And at some point he stopped. And he said, anyhow, all that is just political. Okay, so it was a huge step forward in our direction in particular. And somebody raised his or her hand and said, how to change it? And Stiglitz said, general mobilization, general political mobilization. Okay, and so from this point on, the discussion changed completely, of course, because we just forgot about markets and things like this. And the discussion was much more political because, of course, it's a very political scene. And this type of interpretation is very close to our own view. And so I had this opportunity after my own presentation to speak with Stiglitz during two, two meals when 
lunch and dinner, and we discussed. And Stiglitz was, in a sense, surprised by the emphasis, emphasis that we put and on uh, wages. Okay? Because in Stiglitz, in particular in his inner, Piketty in particular in his book, the emphasis is more on capital income. As you know, Piketty's general interpretation is a problem of rate of return on investment and a problem of <coughs> capital accumula accumulation, if you want, of growth. Rates of growth and rates of uh, return on investment. So if you do that, you are speaking of more wealth inequality. And of course, wage inequality appears because Piketty organized the data on inequality very efficiently with his students. But you see, the focus is necessarily on wealth problem. But actually, if you look at all the data that we have on inequality, inequality was a problem of wages. And so, from the beginning, from the publication of Piketty books and from the data, because we used this data before the book, uh, our focus was on wages. And in a sense, Stiglitz was not very aware of that. Uh, now, Piketty knows that. He finally you know, discovered that. And uh, uh, now he, he acknowledged that. Ex with the exception that he writes that since 2000, about, the role of the capital income in income inequality increased. So there is some kind of comeback of uh, capital income in the formation of inequality in the United States since 2000. But you see, if you consider things since World War II, I mean, it's just a new development. There is a comeback, you know, of inequality linked to capital inequality. But the broad story is basically wages. Okay. Is it clear? I try to explain you the circumstances, what is going on. Okay, the discussions and the interpretations and the new development, how people change their minds and all that. Because research is something, it's a process. Okay. So, in, in other work, other works we present, we used to present inequality in a certain way, and now we change our presentation in this paper here, which will be, will be published in the book with uh, uh, the first uh, text will be from in the proceedings of the conference. Okay with, of course, Stiglitz's uh, text at the beginning and introduction. So uh, now I will present you, the, we will enter into the scene. I must also explain that in a work with uh, Dominique Levy, uh, there is some kind of a Marxian perspective. But our Marxism, because we were students in the 1960s, okay, the first book I published was published in Louis Althusser's collection theory, and the title of the book was The Concept of Economic Law in Marxist Capital. But, you know, decades later, um, we now say that we, in our Marxism, there are two aspects. One aspect is fundamentalism, and the other aspect is revisionism. And it's very important to understand what we do. And this is specifically the theme of this book. Fundamentalism in Marxism and revisionism in Marxism. So fundamental aspect is Marx's theory of history, relations of production, classes, powers, class powers, you know, and so on, class struggle. Because it's completely impossible to understand neoliberalism in particular without a reference to history. It's completely impossible to understand inequality without this fundamentalist Marxian perspective. If you don't do that, you do like Stiglitz, which is first part 
markets, you know, competition and so on, you stop and you say, it's all political. And the only solution is struggle. But we don't do that. Okay? And so it's absolutely necessary to understand history in a Marxist perspective. I do not mean that, of course, that Marxist analysis of economic mechanism was not interesting. It was extremely interesting in his own way, and in particular, given the importance of the relationship between Marxist political economy and Marxist view of history. Nobody ever defined what is capital. I'm not speaking of capitalism. Nobody ever defined what is capital, only Marx. Okay? There is no view of what is capital. You know the story in Marx, capital is not money, it's not commodity, it's not productive capital, it's a, uh, a social substance in a process and so on. It, you cannot change that. Marx explained that in an incredibly nice way. The point is that Marx tried to understand crisis in capitalism, the business cycle. And there he developed interesting ideas. First, he identified very early and very well the business cycle. But it's clear that Marx was completely unable to explain it. Okay? Because, you see, you need some mathematics and you need a lot of data, a lot of information. It's extremely difficult. Marx was reading newspapers. But, you know, he had absolutely no information, no empirical information to understand the phenomenon, a mechanism like the business cycle and crisis. Because Marx thought it was very important politically, because he thought that a revolution will occur, you know, like in 48, you know, with a new, a new big crisis. So this is our relationship to, to Marx. Simultaneously, now the revisionism is, we do not expect a proletarian revolution. <laughs> Okay, Marx developed his view in a certain period of time, huge period of exploitation, huge period of class struggle in the 19th century. This is what we analyze in half of the book here in relation to the French Revolution and all that. But, you know, of course, finally, Marx was wrong in this respect. Okay, and so because he did not understand the new tendency in capitalism, or actually he understood this tendency, but he gave up. Okay? He gave up because this contradicted his political views. So what was the key point? The key point is our thesis in our work during decades and in this book in particular, which is capitalism is transforming itself into a new mode of production that we call managerialism. And what is the link with inequality? The link with inequality is that if you want to understand what's going on in the United States now, because they are much more advanced than France, okay? Now I'm not speaking of Latin America. I'm not even speaking of Europe. I'm speaking of the United States, which is the most advanced country, like England was the most advanced country during the period of the Industrial Revolution. If you want to understand that, you need to understand that capitalism is transforming itself into a new mode of production, which means that there is a new upper class which is emerging, which is a class that we call managers. There is no good term, but in the US, for example, the concept of managerial capital is very well known. In France, if you speak of managerial capitalism, people do not know what you are talking about. But in the US, managerial capitalism is a concept widely acknowledged, of course. There is a huge literature on this theme in spite of neoliberalism. I try to present now our broad perspective to explain you what we are doing. The theme of inequality is directly linked to the theme of the transformations of relation of production and class pattern. Because inequality is a class phenomenon. Inequality is a problem of classes. In a straightforward relationship to Marx's work. Except that Marx had only the notion of capitalism, which means the surplus value, profits, and so on, like Piketty. 
okay, when he wrote his book, when the main factor of the growth of inequality is actually the concentration of very high wages on top of the US society. It's a revolution in Marxism, and this is what we did. Okay. So now I will enter the topic. I must also emphasize another theme, which is in the United States, you have now a central notion, which is a notion of the long stagnation. You heard about that. No? Did you hear about the long stagnation? Yeah. So the long stagnation, when we tell people in the US that you are writing, we are writing a book on macroeconomics, people tell us, friends tell us, why don't you write a book on the long stagnation? Because this is the important theme, in which we play the crucial role. You know, if you go to our web page, you will see the quotation originally. We, <coughs> Gordon in particular, interpretation came from our work. And in the first paper that he published, he mentioned that. Of course, later, our name disappeared. Why? Because he won the Nobel Prize on this. So you cannot cite Dumini Levy, OK? So, so the long stagnation, what is the relationship? The long stagnation and the rise of inequality are exactly the same story. Okay? Of course, they don't acknowledge that. Okay? They, but as I will maybe show, the long stagnation and the rise of inequality are one story. Once you understand what's going on, I will show it to you in the last figure of the paper that everybody read, of course. So you already know everything. So this is extremely important. Hmm. And so now we, we will write a paper soon on the long stagnation, showing the relationship with the rise of inequality. So now I will start with the pictures here despite the poor quality of the images. This is the title of the paper, this is the, okay. So, how do we, this is, we, how do we measure inequality? Very simple. We take the US, the, so, I forgot to mention another thing. Now, Piketty is working, as you certainly know, on a new, huge piece of work, which is called Distributional National Accounting. It's extremely interesting and important. And there is a big appendix in this paper, the first to the second appendix, on this theme. Because we completely disagree with a new perspective. Okay? We completely disagree with what PKT is now doing on Distributional National Accounting. So if you don't know that, go to the appendix and you will find the references and so on. But it's a huge piece of work with a huge lot of money, you know, which is developing now. So I start with a story in a Piketty way, if you want. We are in the United States. We consider all households. This is the first perspective of Piketty. Now, with a distribution National, national, uh, distributional national accounting, Piketty completely changed his view. Okay. So now we are in the old perspective of Piketty, and we consider, as you know, okay, all uh, families in the United States. They pay taxes, okay, and so the basis of the data is income statement for taxation. Is it clear? Hmm? And the idea is the concentration of income at the top. How did the concentration of income at the top change? Okay. This is the main, the first indicator, the first variable to consider inequalities. The idea of concentration of income at the top. We used to consider the top one person. Why? Because Wall Street people use our work. And you know the story 
We are the one person. You are, we are the 99 percent. They are the one person. So, now, because of the work that we did in this book, and because of the work by a chronophysicist, Yakovenko, that you know, okay, now we think that the nice group at the top of the US society to be considered is the top three percent. Okay, so you study the book or you study Yakovenko's studies and you will see that they, they concentrate on the top three person. The only problem is that we don't have the data for the three person. <laughs> okay, we have the data for in Piketty's data, we have the data for one person or the data for five person. Okay. We have the data for one uh, household out of 10,000. We have the data between the data, but we don't have the data for three person, specifically. We have other fract, fract how do you say fractile or fractiles? Uh, fractiles, okay, we, we don't, we don't, we have that, but we don't have the three person. So we used to focus, we consider all available fractals, of course, you know, but we, know, we used to focus on the one person for political reasons. And so now we would like to have the three person, but we don't have it. So now we are using the five person, okay, because this is the other group. Five person is too broad, uh, one person is too narrow, okay. But what we want to show is clearly apparent in the five person. But remember that we consider it's a bit too broad. So now, this is the first variable that you have here, which is five percent top households in their tax income, I can say in their tax income, what percentage of the total income of all households do they concentrate? You understand the meaning of the variable, okay? And the answer is here. And of course the chronology is very important. The answer is here. Prior to World War II, the top 5% used to concentrate about 31% of the total tax income of US families. Okay. And what happened is that after World War II, there was a sharp decrease at the end of World War II decrease of the concentration of income because they were only concentrating maybe here 20, 24%, 3% of total income. Reduction of inequality. Then there is a plateau here and we reach the 1980s. I will speak of neoliberalism later. Okay, skyrocketing, increase of inequality and back to the pri level prior to World War II. What is called the rise of inequality is here. This is the rise of inequality. Actually, it's a restoration, okay? Because such level existed prior to World War II. And when I say World War II, I'm also thinking of the Great Depression, of course, with a period of perturbation. And this is when everything changes in the United States and in the world, very important with the worker movement worldwide and so on. So now, the important question is here. Now we will distinguish within the income of the 5% of the top between capital income and wages. Wages includes all supplements. Capital income includes interest, dividends, capital gains. Okay, so rents also, because they rent buildings like Trump, okay? So the qu now we will distinguish between wages and capital income. And the, <coughs> quest we will st the question is the size of the concentration of wage income in the top 5% and the size of the concentration of capital income in the top, in the top 5%. We keep the same denominator 
which is that we measure all of these variables in percentages of the total income of all households. So since the denominator is the same, the two variables add up to the total. OK? So now, do you have? I will show the variables. And then here, you have the concentration of wage income at the top. Here, you have the concentration of capital income at the top. And what do you see? You see what I will show later, which is that it's not at all the same story. Because the concentration of capital income in the top 5% diminished here after the Great Depression and during World War II tremendously. But then it's basically flat. Okay? While the concentration of income in the top 5% increase here and is the basis of almost the total rise of inequality okay so i will now explain all that but maybe i want to be sure that you understood is it clear okay if you have question ask me because if you don't understand that you will understand nothing of the rest of what I want to say. So, first, now I just want to draw your attention to a number of features that I rapidly mentioned. In this story, you can see. First, here, the sharp decline of capital income during the Great Depression and World War II here. This is a square, rectangle is here. Huge phenomenon. It accounts basically for the decline of inequality during this same period. Then you have the plateau in the two components. Then the arrows shows you, show you the two different distinct tendencies. How the rise of top wedges, okay, was the root of the rise of inequalities, the root of the restoration of inequalities. You can see that here. Also, you know, if you look closer, and this is important, you can see that the arrow here only accounts for the basic mechanism. But you see that in a sense also it's rising a little bit here on top. You see the dotted line here show you that actually if you draw an horizontal line here, you don't account exactly for the complexity because you see a rise here and a rise here. This is another important mechanism on which I will comment later. And, well, the third idea is here with a vertical dotted line here and here. Actually, we have three periods, okay? Simplifying a little bit, we have a first period of high inequality, second period of Lower inequality with a decline at the beginning, and the third period here after 1975 or 1980, which is rising inequality and large inequalities. Okay, so this picture is the same; the variables are the same as before. But I will <coughs> now I will enter. Now I want to comment on this mechanism here, okay? This slight increase here during the third period, basically. So here, you know that in the data that we have, we have a first fractal 0, 90, okay? And then the top 10% in is divided into uh, six or seven fract fractals, I don't remember. Okay, except that we don't have the three persons that we would like to have, but you have various groups. So I will show you on a table here. This is eh, still in the US uh, since World War II and so on. So it's not it's difficult to read, but this is total incomes. Okay, and we you have the traditional fractals zero between zero and ninety. And then the division 1995, 95, 99, there is no 
overlapping, okay? They are separated, 95, 95, 95, and, and so on and so on, up to the top, which is one family out of 10,000, okay? So we are in the US, we are speaking of families, so the, the 0, 90 here, it's about 153 million families, okay? And the top here are 17,000 families, okay? And in between, you have continued. Now, the problem is, this is for one year, 1977 here, and we have the average income in each group. The average income of the 090 is about $32,000 a year, okay? And the average income of a family, the 17,000 families, yeah, I'm, say, I'm already late, don't worry, okay, of, this, of the families here is uh, almost $20 million a year, okay, in this group. So, now, Now I will, we will consider what's happening, you know, in the, the, this, the top uh, ten percent, the, in the fractals that I have shown on the t in the table here. So here we are considering total income. So listen, we are considering purchasing power. This means that we take the total income of each fractal and we divide by the consumer price index. Okay in order to study the purchasing power of each group. But of course, you know, they are very unequal. So we consider an index. How do we form this index? By here, normalizing all purchasing power of all groups in this year here, this short period here, B, uh, which is a 60, uh, I don't remember. Okay, here, in the, here we are in 1980, so it begins in about 60 to this period. Why? Because it's a, it's a period of, during which the unequal purchasing power increased at the same rate. Okay, so we normalize everything here. So this graph doesn't, doesn't tell you here the levels of inequality. It just provides information on the trends, okay? Because we are considering in indexes, indices which are normalized here during those years. But the picture is splendid, okay? This is one of the best figures we ever made here. Because you can see that up to those years here, in, you have a reduction of inequalities. A huge reduction of inequalities. For example, the 0.90% here, you see they had this level of purchasing power prior to World War II, okay? <coughs> then they multiplied by three their purchasing power, okay? Up to the 1960 and 70s. This was a period of progress. And you see the top here, the one household in 10,000 households, you see that the purchasing power diminished tremendously here. It was divided by two or three, actually, up to this period. But what is nice that you see, depending on the level where you are, anytime you are higher, the, 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 the purchasing power diminished more. But when you are in the lower par part of the society, huh, the lower you are, the more the purchasing power increased. It was an extremely nice person period of diminishing inequalities. And then, you know, we reach here, we enter into neoliberalism, and you see exactly the symmetrical, which is the purchasing power of the 0.90% completely flat. There is absolutely no progress of the purchasing power of the 19% of the population in the United States while the purchasing power of the top one in 10,000 was multiplied by 10. This is the rise of inequalities. This rise of inequalities, here we are considering total income, 
Now I go back to the distinction between wages and capital income. This is exactly the same figure, but limited to wages. Okay? You can see here what I have shown before, which is we only have three groups because we, we don't need to, to see, but the, the other curves are here. Okay? They are not shown in the figure, but it's the same story. You can see exactly the same thing for wages. And the rise of top wages at the top was even larger than the rise of total income. Why? Because, as I have shown before, the concentration of income was a problem of wages. Now, how to interpret that? Interpret that in terms of transformations of relations of production. What I have explained at the beginning, the rise of uh, managers in a managerial society. And here we go back to, we are still in the five, top five person. And uh, we will consider two fractals. One is 1995 and 95, 100. So top five person and the five person below. And the problem is the composition of the income of these two groups. If you look at the 1995, 1995, we, uh, university professor should be around 92 here, okay, to give you an idea. When you move to the top 5%, you have people working in corporations or big position in the government, you know, but you see. So here you see that the group between 90 and 95 here, well, there is a transformation here during Ah, the depression and so on, I will not, you can read the paper, I will not comment on that. They are basically wage earners. Because the continuous line shows you, shows you their total uh, income, including capital income or excluding capital income. The variable is the percentages of wages in the total income of these groups. So the zero between 90 and 95, you have wage earners. Okay, they have a little bit of in, uh, financial investment, of course, you know, and you can see, but the difference is almost flat. And this depends, the second curve, if, if you include capital gains here. Okay, now if you consider the top 5%, you see that during this period here, the depression, you know, World War II, this group was, its income was 60% wages which means 40% capital income, okay? Family with 40% capital income, they have a wealth, of course, you know, and we can call that maybe a capitalist family, although they are wa making wages and so on. But you see, here, this variable moved to uh, almost 90%. This is a huge transformation. If you consider the top 5% if you consider in the book, you will see the 1% here. Now, their income is, excluding capital gains, almost 80, more than 80, between 80 and 90% wages. Okay? In the, the 1%, you have exactly the same property. People in the book, you will see in the 1%, 80% wages. And what is striking is a continuous drift here. If you include capital gains, it's a bit different, okay? And we get a percentages of maybe 70% of wages instead of uh, almost 90. So these people have some capital, but their income is massively made of wages at the top. So we always have exactly the same property. Our we interpret that, as I said at the beginning, in terms of transformation of relations of production. We move from a society where being at the top of social hierarchies meant maybe wages to some extent, but very the capital income was, and the accumulation of capital, concentration of the holding of capital was a huge factor. Now we are in a society in which it's not unimportant to have capital and to make capital income, but the really important thing is to be in the top of wage hierarchies and to make 
huge wages because they pay to themselves huge wages. Now, how do we interpret the three periods? We interpret the three periods in terms of what we call social orders, what I will explain rapidly because I want to go to the appendices of the paper. Okay. And uh, what do we call a social order? Social order are class configurations of class powers. So I will go very rapidly. In prior to World War II, you had capitalists and managers, but the power was still in the end of the big capitalists, like Morgan, Rockefeller, and so on. The managerial revolution had already occurred in the sense that these big capitalists now within banks and so on were not managing themselves, their firms. Okay? But you see, these managers had no uh, actual political power. This power emerged during the Great Depression, in particular the importance of the new dealers within governments, because managers are also in the government in our terminology. The second, you remember the three periods that I distinguished in the graph, the second period after World War II was the period of the post-war period, what we call the post-war compromise. This was a period in which managers were managing firms and defining policies without caring about capitalist classes or about the holders of capital. The policies were different with the rise of purchasing power, progress you know, in health, in education, and everything. It was a completely different period when I was young. Okay. So this we call the Passoire Compromise. Be why? Because it was some kind of political compromise between managers and popular classes. The interest of capitalist classes, I will show you if I have time at the end, what happened to the top one family out of 10,000. Huh? <laughs> they were completely worshipped. Okay? Uh, the policies, the way within firms, you can read the book, you will have all the figures there. Okay, within firms, they were paying little dividends. Okay, they were, and so on. There were interest rates, but you know, there was also inflation, and so on. So, the three, the three periods is what we call the first financial hegemony, which is uh, uh, capitalist hegemony. Uh, then you have the post-war compromise. And then you have the second financial hegemony in neoliberalism because neoliberalism was the reversal of the political alliance between managers and popular class classes and the new alliance between managers and, and uh, uh, capitalist classes. This is the political definition of neoliberalism which governs all the technical aspects that I cannot explain today of what neoliberalism is all. And unfortunately for you, you were born during this period. Okay? And so you are in absolutely shitty political period, if I can say. And it's really very bad. Some of you will perform very well. Okay? And so maybe you will be part of this upper group and make a lot of money. Others will have more difficulty, but anyhow, you will uh, live in a terrible period because, of course, I have no time to explain that, but neoliberalism had <coughs> huge consequences, exactly what is happening to, to today. Destruction of global warming, we can say destruction of the environment. The new politics of polarization in the world you can read our work, you will have all the details of that, in particular with Bush Jr. and so on, up to the rise of populism now, which is in every country in the US with Trump, in Italy, in France, hmm, we will see what happened with the new, the new social struggles and so on, but everywhere, and this is perfectly logical, the rise of a new wave of Ref refusal, denial of the social order, which was a consequence of the concentration of power in the upper. So anyhow, even if you make money, it will be terrible for you, and in particular, your children, if you have children. 
So I'm very sorry for you, I will die before, but okay. I have also grandchildren, but so now I will approach the, the same story in a slightly different manner. And it's very difficult when, when Stiglitz say uh, political m mobilization, sure, okay, that's exactly what I think. The problem is how to do it. And I'm afraid we have to wait a few decades for that. But maybe it will change more rapidly. So now I will show you, I will approach you know, this in a slightly different manner. Uh, here, we are in the US still, and we are considering all corporations in the US. So we focus, yes and no. We focus on corporations, okay? And the, I will call, in a society in which you have two upper classes, a managerial capitalist society, you have on the one hand capital income and the other hand top wages. Top wages, I consider the wages in the top five person because I don't have the three person. And so if we call, there is a capitalist surplus, which is profits, there is a managerial surplus that I define as the wages in the top 5%. And the curve here shows you what happened. In a pure Marxist view of exploitation, what happened was the concentration of income at the top. If you add up the two surplus, two surpluses, which means capital income, total capital income, and the wages of the top 5% I've shown in the first figure how it rose tremendously, you get this share of total income. The, the sum of the two surplus, concentration of income in, so as wages, concentration and capitalist income, you can see that during the 1970 year, you had maybe 27%. Okay, but with neoliberalism, you have a rise and actually they gain 12% here. The two, the two surplus considered together. So they are just eating up total income. Of course, you know, given what I have shown before. Now we will consider the two surpluses separately. And so you can see here the capitalist surplus, this line, and here the managerial surplus here. And you can see the total is a two, the, the, the curve at the top here. And you can see how the two surpluses diminish here, uh, of course, you know. And then you have the rise of the managerial surplus here. And here you have the decline of the capitalist surplus. And since 2000 about, there is a new rise in a sense. Okay. How do we do that? We use the hierarchy of our. You will see the technical aspect in the, in the paper. Okay. So now what I will do, I forget about the managerial surplus and I will consider the capitalist surplus that is profits. Okay. And you remember, so declining a lot during World War II, stagnating here, stagnating there up to 2000 rising here. This is the capital the share you know, of total va added value which goes to, to as capital income. And now my question, the question here, how do we divide that? Uh, what is happening to that? And here you have this curve here, which is extremely nice, okay? And uh, if you take the total of the capitalist surplus, it is used in two ways. One way is return within corporations. The other way is distributed as income or used, but not written within corporations for investment. The, the fraction which is not kept as capital income within corporation can be used to pay dividend, to pay interest. We are after taxes, of course, okay? We distribute taxes first. And the third component, which is extremely important, is a repurchase by corporations of their own stock shares. Because corporations in the US for huge amount are repurchasing their own shares. Why? In order to increase the stock market, the value of their corporation, 
which means capital gains. If you subtract this interest paid, you know, the uh, profit distributed as dividend and the use of this money, of this profit to repurchase shares, you know, you get return profit. Okay, return profit used for investment. And you have the two fraction here. Okay, if you take the total profit, now, with neoliberalism, 100% is distributed or used to repurchase share. How much do they have to make investment? 0% in the average. Incredible, but you can do the computation and you will find that. In the average, 0% of profit after accounting for the repurchase of their own shares, which is some kind of negative accumulation, is kept for investment. How do they invest? Because they invest very little, okay? But they do invest. The foreign investment plays a very limited role for a reason that maybe we will explain <coughs> during, I will explain during the discussion. So you can see fluctuation. How do they invest? They invest by using depreciation allowances, which means, you know, negative accumulation. They don't reproduce the capital. And second, they invest, and this is something that we analyze in the new book that we are writing in a very detailed manner, by borrowing. But retained incomes, once you account for all distribution, for the repurchase of their own shares, which is money going out to households, you see, in the average, zero. There is a fluctuation here. So here, you have the key to the long stagnation. Okay, a country like that is just finished, okay? And China can go forward everywhere, in particular in Venezuela and everything like this. It's a total catastrophe, yes? Uh, could you a little bit more explain what depreciation analysis is? Ah, depreciation, well, I will explain that during the discussion. I will finish and, and then we will, we, will, uh, we will discuss that. Okay, so I will skip all that. Now, just a few minutes, if I can, on PKT's new distributional national accounting. So in national accounting, you have income which are calculated and so on, but you see, you know nothing, there is no mention of inequality. There is no mention of distribution. If you calculate, if you look at NIPA, for example, you see, well, okay, income, but value added, but you don't know. The fraction of value added going to the top 10% of uh, and so on. The two seem national accounting and uh, income distribution are two different things. So there is a huge project which is huge as money now. You will find the references in the paper if you don't know that because you absolutely need to know that. Uh, of course, which is now we will combine everything, okay? We will articulate uh, national accounting with inequality with and so on. Okay. So this is what Piketty is doing now. Huh? And so we completely disagree with the new approach. And why is it important to us? Because this new approach is based in a very surprising manner on the idea that shareholders are just the total owners of everything, okay? Within corporation, shareholder, it means we are in a pure capitalist society. There is absolutely nothing like the power of managers. The managers are the agents of the shareholders, which are the owner. The owner of everything within corporation. And the consequences on historical interpretations are huge, as I will rapidly explain now. And this graph here shows you what Piketty and the group Okay, are actually doing, I'm very sorry for the poor picture here. Okay, so the idea is everything within corporation belongs to shareholders. So here you have, uh, this is a fraction of value added here. Here you have the fraction that Piketty considered before, which is a fraction going to, going to households, which is interest, dividends, and so on. It's a small fraction. But now, you see, in firms here, this adds up, okay. You have here um, retained earnings, 
because they do not subtract the fraction of return, so-called return earnings which are used to repurchase, to repurchase stock shares. So they have a positive return earnings. But if you subtract the return, the, this return earning is not available for investment because it's used to repurchase share. Okay, so you have return earning here. But they consider that the return earning belongs to shareholders. Okay, so even, you know, the taxes paid by corporation, thank you, even the taxes paid by corporations here belong to the income of shareholders prior to paying taxes, the pre pre-tax. Because of course, you know, the shareholders they own everything in the corporation. So they own the return earnings, they also earn, if you consider income prior to the payment of taxes, they also pay, shareholders are supposed to pay the uh, taxes uh, of corporation because they earn everything. And even the more so surprising thing here is pension funds, the payment, the contribution of all families in the US to pension funds. The contribution, how you know, wage earner pay money for their pension funds. This is considered profits in Piketty new approach. Why is it considered profits? Very, very strange. Because it will be used to make financial investment within the pension fund itself. Then they will receive, you know, the money and so on. This is a huge a fraction here. So the consequences of this treatment is the capital income was completely flat during since World War II and prior since World War I. The, the capital income was completely percentage of capital income in total value added. Why? Because return profits are not a subtraction from the income of families. Because the capitalist class owns the corporations. So firms keep the money, the profits, but you know, the shareholders own the corporation, so it's just like, it's just as if they receive the profit, which is just unbelievable. If you do that, of course, you understand exactly nothing to politically and economically what the post-war period was, okay? Because nothing changed, you know, just corporations which were managed by managers, like in uh, so many studies in the US, okay, uh, of uh, managerial capitalism, they firms were not paying out uh, uh, to incomes to, to capitalist family, and uh, I could show the income uh, of, the top, of the top group. It did, did not matter, why? Because any our shareholders were the owners of corporations. So distributing or not distributing, using this money for investment or not, had no importance. And the idea is this money which was returned here would necessarily show up in the stock market, in, in ca capital gains in the stock market, because the money was kept you know, within corporations that the shareholders own completely. Okay, so this money was kept, would show up in capital gains. Because, as everybody knows, the economy is always in a full equilibrium and there is no power relationship, there is no class, okay, capitalist class, and that's it, and the rest are just wage earners. So, the idea was, well, we think that capitalist shareholders, you know, owned the entire return profits. But this, of course, would show up in the stock market. And so we look at Tobin's Q here, which is the stock market. But the stock market understands something at the economy and at political relationships, contrary to economists. And of course, during the period when they, they were, the firms were conserving here during the post-war compromise, they were keeping all income, the stock market was extremely low. The stock market increased with neoliberalism. So the, if you look only at a variable like Tobin's Q, we know what Tobin's Q is about, huh? you see that actually the stock market doesn't follow Piketty, okay? Because they understand what's going on in the economy. So there are other things that I could show. And uh, well, 
may I will stop here because of the limitation of time. And uh, so you, I hope, can understand the relationship between this new, the political, ec political economy perspective of this new work on distributional accounts, which is based on the idea that we are in a capitalist society. There is only one class, which is the capitalist class. They own everything within corporation. So if corporation do not distribute profit, it changes exactly nothing for capitalists because they are the owners. So they don't receive the money. Doesn't matter because the stock market will increase because the value of firm is increasing because they keep the money. Okay. And if you look at stock market indices, you see that is absolutely not true. And the uh, key, you know, variable is Tobin skew, which is the ratio between the value and the market and the value of corporation, uh, as you probably know. So the failure to understand the transformation of relations of production, I stop. Okay, the failure to understand that has huge economic, political consequences, and it's completely impossible to interpret what happened in uh, since the Great Depression or since the first World War I, you know, without entering into this type of logic, or you are pushed to produce things which can absolutely not be defended even empirically. So I will stop here. So welcome back, everybody. Um, we're now going to do a presentation, and Jorim is going to start, I guess. So I just hand you over the microphone. Well, no, it's just the contents, basically. We will start, uh, Michelle will start with a short excursion into to Marxism, um, talking about class structure. Um, then we wanted to take a closer look at the corporate control. And in the end, uh, Chris will yeah, ask the question, t talk about money manager or shareholder or capitalism as well. Um, so it's a very short one for me here. Okay. So just reinforcing the importance of classes for the discussion and comprehension of economics, we have some statements here from different authors. And from, Carl, uh, from Marx and Engels, we have, uh, that's a very known phrase, the story of all existing society mm -hmm. is the story of class struggles. It's a bit difficult to read the slides here on the side, so. No. Oh, sure. You can just Maybe you can. Chair. No, no, I, I will move to the, I don't need a chair, no? okay? Okay. Uh, I will move to the back here. So, from Schumpeter, it also states that it's fairly open to question precisely how important the phenomenon of social classes is for research in the field of purely economic theory. Uh, that is very important for many practical applications and for all the broader aspects. And also from right, we have the statement that to ignore class relations in conducting research on social stratification is to ignore one of the fundamental dimensions of social inequality in modern society. So as Professor also mentioned, uh, capitalism has faced some structural crisis and this structural crisis leads to new social orders which are uh, as political configurations of domination and alliance between the classes. So we have now the uh, capitalist managers and the popular classes, and under the neoliberalism, uh, which is the neoliberal capitalism, is that the new social order was implemented to restore and increase the power, income and wealth of upper classes, So, which are the capitalists and the managers. From the Marx approach, we have the polarization between the capitalists and the popular classes, and as we all know, the capitalism on the means of production, and then the popular classes sell its labor power. So we are missing the uh, managers in this sense. And there is this uh, attempt to explain this class, uh, which is a an expansion of the Marxist approach. It started on the 70s with some discussions, and uh, two 
to try to explain these intermediate, intermediate roles, such as managers, supervisors, salaried professionals. And these discussions were generating this, uh, a series of boundaries problems. And then we have some authors that discussed this in the literature, so called the boundary debate. And we are, there are attempts, that there are contributions from authors such as Nico Polanzas, uh, Guillermo. Carcheggi, I'm sorry, if I'm, I'm not sure if I'm spelling right, and others. But the most uh, sustainable attempt is from Eric Olin Wright and his book of Class Structure and Income Determination, and where he, is uh, he explains about the theory of contrad contradictory class locations. And uh, these theories try to explain the position of managers that are in between the classes and they have uh, these contradictory interests that are they are positioning as workers because they are exploited by capitalists and yet they are like capitalists themselves because they dominate and control the workers. Uh, now moving to the paper specifically and what reinforces this uh, class struggle. We can see here some other examples that proves that uh, we have the difference between the, the incomes and this very huge gap. And it starts uh, with the union membership that it's decreasing, and on the other hand, the incomes of the higher part of the population is uh, increasing. And the ratio, which also reinforces this, is the ratio between the large company CEO's uh, wages and the US workers. So it has uh, uh, increased like eight times over the, uh, since 98 until 2016. So there are just some highlights between this uh, discussion that we would like to bring under the, the paper and that are related to the managers and the uh, as a, they are in between the capitalist and popular classes. So it says in the paper that the cost of capitalist owners uh, of the historical shift of initiative, capability and power into the hands of managers was the rising wages in the upper layers of income hierarchies. So it's, uh, it's just a question. Is there a possible conflict of interest? So if it means higher wages, on the opposite hand, it means less profits. Do capitalists support this strengthening of the managerial classes? And also for us, uh, it's quite unclear the definition of managers and their role. So it's something that we would like to approach also. And another thing that we have seen in the society as well is the entrepreneur, entrepreneurial increase over the wages. And it, is it like an overlapping position? Is it possible to distinguish the entrepreneurs and their wages and capitals in this case is another thing that we would like to point out. And the last one is regarding the, the breakdown of wages within the 5%. So it's very not clear the composition of wages, for example, the weight of entrepreneurs, maybe the weight of the corporate sector and the share between small, big firms and so on. And how, uh, if it's possible, uh, wages that are not related to firms. Thank you. So the second half of our comment and presentation uh, will firstly yeah, Chris and I will talk uh, similar, firstly be a definition of corporate control and then pose the question, um, there's, it's not only Piketty who, who raised this but also other people in the financialization literature whether it is uh, shareholder or money manager capitalism or the managerial capitalism. But first of all, uh, for this is um, a very basic, yeah, a very basic definition is um, from Burles and Means already, uh, Burles and Means in 1932, the modern corporation and private property, they already asked this main question, is there and if, what separation is there? They had a pessimistic view, they saw that there will be um, a separation of ownership and control becoming and then that will have a f effect of the managers having maybe the wrong incentives. Um, there were also a few other definitions which you have all in the paper, for example Veblen, um, but we will not talk about this. Uh, firstly, I just wrote very quickly, 
I don't think, maybe you don't think about these myths, but some people maybe do. So the shareholders control the operation. No, uh, yeah, the operation or the corporation. No, that's wrong. They only are the owners of the corporation's shares. At the same time, managers do also not own the, um, the firm or the corporation. They manage the assets. The one person in law, it's really a person, is the corporation who is the sole owner because the corporation manages all the assets. That's the, that's the, um, the sole owner. We then have, uh, again here, the quote from Berl the Means, and there's two parts of the sentence, um, a longer one. First of all, control is an elusive concept for power. Uh, for power can rarely be sharply segregated, uh, se segregated or clearly defined. So this, first of all, shows that it's a very complex, complex issue. So this is a complexity we're looking into. It. And second of all, uh, control lies in the hands of the individual or group who have the actual power to select the board of directors. This shows us now um, that it is important to, to look more closely in, in how does corporate control work, how has this evolved, to yeah, understand or question the broader context of your, of your um, transformation of capitalism. So there's um, two things I want to mention mm, because we, yeah, we were short on time. First of all, you have insiders and outsiders in the firm. Top management, for example, you could think of being the insiders, having most knowledge. The outsiders could be the large owners of the shares, bankers, asymmetric problems. Um, and then you have uh, the concept of one share, one vote, which um, you could cl look more closely at to understand what is actually happening, who is actually controlling, who is actually making decisions in this company. So for this, um, we, we first of all, um, I think you all know the pyramid ownership. Um, I could draw it maybe. It's basically um, only that you can own or uh, you can control a company with um, yeah with less than 50 50 percent you can um, you can have you are here the first and you can own the first company um, with 50 plus one percent own the next one with 50 plus one percent and you always have the minority um, ownership so let me quickly give you the yeah, the definitions of control, the complete ownership of a uh, company, co complete control is above 80%, generally defined. The majority above 50%, like politics. But you can also have minority control around 20%, but actually some people argue it's around 5 to 10%. Because you have the pyramid control, you also have overlappi overlapping directorates or um, representatives. So the last one... Um, that I wanted to show is just uh, the, the literature and, and the work that we had from our professor at CEPEN also, Paris 13, Tristan Ovray, um, looking at these structures, the complexity, the interlocks um, of ownership linkages. And um, yeah, our main question, and uh, Chris will uh, elaborate on this, is there are a lot of people who, who say that the share shareholders do have still a little lot of power. And um, if you look at these stages of capitalist development, we are basically only focusing on what group holds the greatest economic power. And as you can see here, um, Minsky has said, after the 1982, uh, it has been the money managers or are the, t are the corporate managers. Thank you. So I will continue and go a little bit into the discussion more what, uh, what Joram just raised. Uh, why are we doing this? Because um, you, 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 um, you're going into this notion that um, this, this transformation of capitalism is like mainly transformed or just like um, sharply um, formed by, by managers, like by, by the managers and the class of the managers. So we wanted to contrast this with uh, another strand of literature with the uh, financial financialization literature of post keynesian economics. And um, like just to, to say the, the standpoint you're raising in the paper is capitalism is transforming itself into a new mode of production that we denote as managerialism. And um, I think, like, I guess you really know those other authors as well, Lazonic and O'Sullivan, in a paper in 2000, they, uh, which is called Maximizing Shareholder Value, a New Ideolo Ideology for Corporate Governance. They basically also describe um, this new move, move to neoliberalism, with, um, which then they claim um, is, for, uh, is in the name of creating shareholder value. Um, so they say, for example, that the stock uh, like the stock options as bonus to manager wages to align managers' interests, um, the increased dis distribution of dividends, 
and uh, increase stock repurchases um, to in, uh, increase the value of firms stocks um, has been done uh, in the area of neoliberalism to push those those upper um, classes incomes and just the first graph for this is the um, yeah like um, announced death cuts um, from 1989 until 1990 uh, 1998 uh, in the US and we see like this increased in this area from yeah f from the late 80s uh, which is then like always a, um, a sign for the financial markets to um, increase the or, like it's it's always positively taken by financial markets if you downsize the the company so this this quote downsize and distribute of Lazonic and Sullivan um, two other pictures just which really fit into this neoliberal uh, era is the first one here on the left side um, in the 60s uh, until the 70s 70s until 80s we have really low um, percentages or like comparatively low um, percentages of uh, corporate dividends paid out, like 42%, both around. And then in the 80s, with the start of the neoliberal era, which you also described, uh, the dividends increase um, majorly by like around 7 8%. So we have a shift here. And the same for share buybacks, where it's increasing from the 1980s until 1996. Majorly, uh, yeah, we can definitely put a trend here, which is then starting or like denoting this this new liberal era. Um, so, how has this been uh, seen in, in the literature? Maybe like just uh, concentrate on this middle um, middle row here. Um, there is a paper by two type papers by Stockhammer, 2004 and 2005, where he is basically arguing that uh, managers objectives through financialization align with the shareholders' aims. So, shareholders' aims. Uh, to get uh, the most profit or revenues out of the companies. Managers would more be seen like, okay, we want to have high growth, we want to have a high market share and power as, as, as managers. Um, so here, financialization has the effect that managers' uh, interests are aligned with uh, shareholders. Delery, 2008, he's having one example where he's having a Gabrafian firm, so managers are in total control of the firm. And here, shareholders can just um, increase the pressure on, uh, on, on managers which are then more financially constrained. There is uh, yeah, the post keynesian theory of the firm. We have a uh, financial constraint and an extension constraint. I'm not going into this right now, but this is like constraining further the managers. Or here's another example where he then says, okay, managers completely align with the interests of, uh, of shareholders. And um, yeah, which has then also the effect that uh, we have decrease of the growth growth incentive of the or growth uh, regime of the firm but rather the distribution and profit maximization motive so um, just to to compare this a little bit in both uh, of the strands of literature we have a division of the classes managers and capitalists um, but as you are claiming um, the managerial capitalist financial hegemony like in the deferred phase you were um, denoting um, there is an alliance between capitalists and managerial classes but the manager, managers are still in the leadership of those two classes, so they have the defining power. Whereas, uh, we just saw before, in the uh, post keynesian strand, we have um, the shareholders more in power. So, um, yeah, another thing then which is coming to this, um, you are saying in the paper that wage earners and managers' investment in funds doesn't transform into, doesn't transform into, into capitalists, which is then also saying, okay, or which I was a little bit wondering about, but because you had this also, if we have this high uh, incomes of managerial, managerial surplus, um, which are like in the top 001%, uh, about 20 million per household, this definitely also showing that it's not only a li alliance maybe, but like also like that the persons are combining both function in themselves. So yeah, and the last point, are both notions actually mutually exclusive? So maybe it's also the case that um, it's just like two different interpretations of the uh, of the same things, but which are not exclusive to one other one another. So this leads us to our questions and discussion points. Um, yeah, first, like the first two questions are on what I just uh, elaborated on. So. Um, can we still say that uh, capitalists and managers classes that there is this distinct separation between them? But especially in the in the top one percent or top zero zero one percent, is there this distinction? Can can we still claim this? And um, oh, I think something shifted here. Um, yeah. Then another question: possible conflict of interest, capitalists uh, versus managers, um, high wages, less profits. 
Yeah. The entrepreneurial class, um, how can it be assessed? Because it was like um, the missing link in the last, uh, in, the, in the first um, graphs. Then why should managerialism be uh, more convincing than the notion of money manager capitalism? Or is it the two, two interpretation of the same trend? And uh, is managerialism as a new mode of production valid for world's capitalism? Only advanced economies, or is it like a difference of bank-based and market-based economies? Because you were doing the case for the U.S., which is a heavily market-based economy, but maybe we have really different patterns in the in, in other countries, for example, Germany or France. So, what would we see for this general transition of capitalism for those really capitalist countries as well? And yeah, I think that's it. So, if you are willing to come to the stage, and we can. Uh, can you, you go put back the slides to the again? Last yes. Slide, this one. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Five to ten minutes rest, maybe for, for or fifteen reply. minutes. Yeah. Uh, how much time reply, do I have? Maybe five to ten minutes. Okay. So it's, it's good. Nice to have some time for the yeah. Sure. Sure. Okay. So first, a uh, general comment. And we can take questions. Okay. This is a paper, excluding the appendices, which is about uh, twenty pages long. Okay, so first book I published on managers was published in 1975, 73. Okay, and then we have constantly been working on that. And our last book is really a synthesis on, of this. And uh, we constantly refer to this book in the paper, but you had no time to look at it. Okay, so you speak of this paper as if the paper was a complete exposition of our view on the transformation of capitalism and uh, the rise of managers and managerialism. And it is not the case at all, okay? So that's the reason why you have maybe five notes to say that we explain that in other places, various books in French, English, and so on. So this is some kind of problem in perspective in what you said, okay? And the second, this is a general commentary. And uh, I will, maybe because I don't have time, because I want to answer this question, okay? So, for example, in the book, we have a chapter, a long chapter, which is going through the entire literature on the theme of managers. And in particular, all in right, okay? And many others. It's a complete chapter with maybe 50 references, okay? But don't expect in a 20 pages paper on inequality to find a complete review of the literature. Now you are fascinated by the idea of contradictory class position. No, absolutely not. Saying contradictory class position in the words of Olim Wright is exactly the same thing as saying that managers are an intermediary class in the contemporary society. It doesn't they are exploited by capitalists, they exploit workers. There is absolutely, we discussed that in the book, there is absolutely nothing except what everybody knows, which is that managers are in a kind of intermediary class position in contemporary capitalism. Okay? But we believe that their position is rising. So how can you be fascinated by this type of idea, which is absolutely plain, you know? absolutely adding nothing by the concept of contradictory class position, which is a completely fake dialectic. Okay, so I, you could look in the book what we say about that. I'm very surprised, okay? But it's work always working. Now, you know, for example, people like Lazonic, we had a debate with Lazonic. Of course, we know the max maximizing, you know, profit rates actually in corporation and the returns and so on. We all know that, of course, within neoliberalism. Contrary to the post-war period, in contrary to the post-war period, yes, the maximizing of rate, profit rate in a certain manner or value in the stock market came back to the fore because you have now this new alliance. While you know, managers in the post-war period were not caring at all about the stock market, now the stock market is back to the center. In the paper, our reply to Lazonic, which commented on our work, we explain very clearly and thoroughly 
Of course, we agree with that. This is everybody knows that in, in neoliberalism, except that this is an extremely narrow approach to what neoliberalism is about. This is one aspect of neoliberalism. But neoliberalism is a bunch of other things, like globalization, like financialization, and so on. Now, I'm surprised, you know, the notion of uh, the power of financial managers. This is and has been a central theme, and it's even very clearly mentioned in the paper. Of course, we say that within neoliberalism now, and within managerialism, the power, the main power, the leadership, is in the end of financial managers. We wrote that even in this particular paper, we write that everywhere, okay, everywhere. And in the books, in French, and the book, this little, uh, book here, okay, it's absolutely central. We have chapters on that. So is it similar? Is it different? Well, we would say that, yes, of course, the power is concentrated. Now there is a leadership of financial manager. But the problem of manager is much broader than that. And you have a huge literature on that. You have to acknowledge the managerial transformation of our society. And second, you have to acknowledge the leadership of financial managers, to which we devoted chapters, you know, in this book. Now, it's also related to the way you spoke of controls and so on. Really, read the book. There is an extremely nice chapter, which is about the work of other econophysicists, which is the work about the financial structures. OK, the financial structure, the big financial institution. How do they control the entire system? What is the relationship between financial managers and other managers? It's not everything in this paper, I'm very sorry, okay? And we refer to that, but we even mention the power of financial managers. So I'm sorry for saying that you are a little bit, you know, taking this paper for a general exposition of our view, and it is not the case, okay? We refer in footnotes to, to other places, and we try not to refer in footnotes at every pages, you know, because it would be completely ridiculous. Now, your points here are good, and I will try to answer to these questions, or uh, to these points. Which is, <coughs> uh, yes, in neoliberalism, we believe that there is some kind of alliance between what remains of capitalist classes and managers. And we compare that to the transition between feudalism and capitalism with, uh, you say, hybrid, 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 hybrid you say? Uh, hybrid, you know, features, you know? Uh, <coughs> it's a relationship, as Mao Zedong would have said, you know, in which you have cooperation and struggle. Because there are two different classes, you know, so they are, it's just like after World War II, the alliance between a, a popular classes and manager under managerial leadership was also a relationship which was cooperation and struggle. Because we are speaking of cooperation and struggle between distinct classes. Of course, in neoliberalism, you have this alliance. But we can see that maybe now capitalists are pulling in a little bit, you know, pushing their income and so on, and managers in other periods are pushing the other direction in the management of earth in political issues. If we had time to discuss about policy, of course, cooperation and struggle. This is exactly what we mean, you know, by alliance. Does it mean that they are identical? There is no divergence of interest. If not, it would be a single class. It would not be the alliance between two distinct classes, just like after World War II, there was cooperation and struggle between capitalist and popular classes. Now, yes, of course there is a conflict. Of course, you know, because between 1980 and 2000, the main phenomenon was the increase of upper wages. Not, not only you know, at the top of the top, but in the five person, in the one person, we are speaking of million people here, okay? Of course, there was a conflict about income distribution. First, they were able to dominate the other classes. If you take the 0, 90 group, zero progress of purchasing power. It's not bad, okay? Now, of course, at the top, they are also cooperating 
and struggling, and of course, you know, be sure, the, when m uh, managers pay to themselves huge uh, wages, okay, these disappear from profit, and these disappear from dividend, but they just can't go on distributing dividend because they distribute everything. Okay, so you have really to understand the concept of what is the alliance at the top, which is really cooperation and struggle. Well, the entrepreneurial class, there is an appendix, you know, in the book about entrepreneurial income. Okay, why we made an appendix? Because all that is very complex. If you want to consider everything in one blow, you know, it's impossible. So you have an appendix on entrepreneurial income. It's very complex because of the transformation of the nature of entrepreneurial income. You have a decline of some kind, kind of a traditional you know, form of small owners and so on. And then you have the rise of new form of entrepreneurial income. We went into the data as ever to see exactly what happened. It's not possible to completely clarify this issue, but it's not a big issue. It's interesting, like any other type of issue, but this is not a key to the understanding of what is going on now. Now, why should managerialism be more convincing than the notion of money manager capitalism? Our view is, as I said, managerial, the rise of managerial power under the domination of financial manager. We wrote that everywhere for decades now, okay? In particular, in this book. So it's not contradictory. We just believe that the single reference to money manager capitalism is too narrow. Money manager, the power of uh, financial manager must be understood as one aspect of, manager, of managerial power, very important, and that's the reason why we studied it in a very detailed manner. Okay? And now, <coughs> managerialism as a new mode of production, is it valid for World Cup capitalism? Okay, we wrote that in the paper, and I said it very rapidly, I'm very sorry. Yeah. But you see, the answer is a little bit. Okay, why? Because I spent a lot of time, for example, in Latin America. Yeah, recently, oh, I was in, uh, in Mexico every year, in Brazil, and so on. What we say is, as we write, for the United States, for the United Kingdom, much less for France. And of course, you cannot just apply that to, to Brazil, for example. Because now, that's the reason why we say what we, the story we tell is like England during the Industrial Revolution, which was showing the way to the rest of the world. Then it came to France. In Germany, nothing, and later in Germany. And in Africa, nothing, okay, obviously. So, yes, there is always a country in this type of transformation which is a leader. So, how is the situation in Brazil? They have everything, traditional capitalism. They have very big, uh, very rich, you know, families and so on, traditional capitalism. But they are also in the new system because, of course, they have managers, okay? They have managers and they, within corporation, and also they have transnational corporation. Since they have transnational corporation, they are under the rule, you know, of manager in general and financial manager, in particular in the United States or in Europe. So they are like the situation of you, the continental Europe during the Industrial Revolution. So the new relations of production are gradually. Uh, advancing, you know, they, they are moving toward this type of countries, but you cannot say, we always say we are speaking mostly of the United States, which are the leaders in this movement, and we are speaking of the United Kingdom and maybe Germany, but Germany is also different, okay, we wrote a lot on that. So, you know, yes, that's a very good question. No, we are not saying that this is the new mode of production is as advanced in every part of the world, okay? There is a geographical, you know, situation in these, uh, in these countries, okay? So your questions are good, and uh, I don't want... <laughs> obviously, you know, you are based on this paper, and from this paper you has asked a good question that we, of course, you know, discussed uh, in other work, but you are not making a presentation on our work in general but on this paper, which is still a paper on inequalities, okay? 
and uh, in the United States in particular, with constant references to other works in footnotes or in the text, and uh, that we tried to limit, you know, because the purpose of the paper was not to reproduce what we have been writing for 40 years, okay? Okay, thank you a lot. Um, yeah, we, we agreed uh, it was broad, so we were kind of having to figure out where to concentrate. But then we open the floor. I'm very sorry, you know, because I'm no. when I speak, I'm always rather violent, okay? <laughs> so it's so okay, no, it's no, 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 I don't feel I'm, I'm a very nice person. Uh, I will <laughs> na never try to, uh, to hurt you, but you must understand that I spend, uh, I work a lot, you know, and uh, to me, uh, I believe in what I'm doing, you know, so I try to defend it, okay? Yes. And so, in bed, uh, you. Okay. We would open the floor and we would ask you if you are willing to take three questions at a time. Yes, uh, yes, okay. or maybe right on me. I would rather do one question, okay? Okay, we can also do one, one question. question. I will try to be short, which is almost impossible. Then the first but, uh, question will be. Uh, uh, well, okay, we can go with three questions, so maybe I should take a piece of paper, but if I forgot, you will tell me, okay. Yeah. Mm. I, so far, I have seven questions here. Yeah, no. Okay. Okay, well, thank you. Um, I have a pen, actually. Mm. Oh, there yeah, okay, thank you. Ali, let's go for three. Okay. Well, thank you for your presentation. My name is Eduardo. I'm from Brazil. I'm from mm -hmm, Track mm -hmm. B. I'm studying macroeconomics and political economy in the program. Where? Where? Here. I'm no, I'm in Brazil. Ah, in Sao Paulo. I'm from Sao Paulo. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I had never seen before that data about the sharp decrease in inequality in the US uh, in the Second World, world War. Mm -hmm. I found it very interesting. And what I wanted to ask is, um, I mean, this is not in the paper as far as I understand, uh, but uh, do you have uh, an understanding regarding uh, What's the role that the war itself played in in the reduction of, of inequality in that in that chart uh, reduction in inequality, and uh, a bit uh, looking at it in a, a bit of a broader sense? I mean, you, there are many people who argue that you have a structural crisis starting in the Great Depression, and which is just resolved in after the Second World War. World mm. war. So, in that sense, if you also have an understanding of what's the role that the war plays and the decrease in inequality pr plays for uh, overcoming this structural crisis. Thank you. Okay, very good. Hi, my name is Sophie. I'm from Option B, Macroeconomics and Finance. You are from what? I'm from Germany. Okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, I am from Option B, sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I have a question following up a notion you brought up in your um, previous book which is the distinction between white-collar and blue-collar workers and the emerging struggle between those classes. And as it seems to me, you have not, like at least I don't know about any following up work on that. And I find that idea very interesting that we don't only have struggle between managerial capitalists and workers, but also between workers. And when we focus on inequality, that there is always this concentration on the top and the bottom, but the actual shifts at the bottom and the struggle that goes on there is not really in the focus. And I would just be curious if you have worked a bit on that, if you have anything um, yeah, to follow up on that. Uh, hello, thanks for your presentation. Uh, my name is, is Matheus, <laughs> I'm from Brazil. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> my name is Matheus, I'm from Brazil and from Option B, Macroeconomics. And, uh, I totally understand your critics to the distribution of national accounting from PKT. And, but um, I was wondering which alternatives then are posed to go beyond merely the, the survey data. Because for me it was very interesting the way they, they could uh, bring together the tax income data and then uh, the distribution from the national accountings. From the, from the aggregate data. So I was wondering we, uh, how can we go, uh, how can we use this data, which is not, uh, by not following the same flaws or that you have pointed in Piketty's approach. And uh, re well, regarding what you say about writing of underdeveloped, about underdeveloped countries, as you mentioned, specifically my country, uh, I see a, a bit more focus from some, uh, using Lavoie's terminology, uh, orthodox dissidents, I think you would put uh, both Piketty and Milanovic on it, I'm, I'm, if I'm not mistaken. And on underdeveloped countries and, uh, and going beyond and going on the specific issues and many times, at least quoting them. 
And you mentioned now uh, we, are, we, we talk about US and then we, uh, we are talking about what happens in Brazil. And I see this, their, their focus more of than, reg than the focus of post Keynesians, at least for, I have, for what I have read so far as one, among others, of course, one of the reasons for their work is getting more widespread. So also, how can we um, consile more these, not abandoning studying of uh, the, the major trends of the system, but uh, including uh, the underdeveloped countries and specific issues in this approach, and not by simply people from underdeveloped countries fo focus on these countries, people from rich countries focus on rich countries to have a more integrated approach. So, yeah. Okay, Sh should I answer? Yeah, he's gonna. Are you one for? No, uh, I have a microphone, yeah. so. Okay, so first question. Uh, World War II inequality and so on. Well, I spoke very rapidly, of course, you know. So, so uh, often we say the uh, post-depression, post-war compromise, okay? Uh, in the sense that you have to consider jointly the depression and the war. And as you said, we did a lot of work on uh, the Great Depression and we always explain that actually they went out of the a Great Depression because of World War II, because in 1937 Roosevelt was still not convinced that they needed a deficit and everything. But then came the war, and the war economy, the deficit and everything, so they were able to go out of the, of the crisis. So uh, and now, you know, it's, it's more complex, even more complex than that, because you have a huge political aspect that I did not mention, but when we, that we always study and mention, which is, or I just mentioned in two words, you know, as a worker movement. Uh, independently of what became of USSR, independently of the failure of the revolution in Germany, independently of so many things, independently of the split between Bolshevik and Menshevik and everything, this doesn't change the fact that capitalist world was under a huge threat, you know, because of class struggle in the Marxian, Marxian Leninist sense of the term, okay? And this was absolutely a key factor if you read Schumpeter, Socialism, Capitalism, and Democracy 42, okay? Uh, Schumpeter was convinced, you know, was completely convinced that capitalism was done, okay? And that we were entering, it was necessary, we were necessarily within a transition to socialism, but which, because Schumpeter is a huge thinker, okay? And he was right, but simultaneously wrong, because he confused socialism with managerialism, because the kind of view that he had, you know, of a new society in which the power of capitalism would disappear was a society organized from the top, okay? Of course, we analyze that in the book and everywhere, okay, because it's very important. So, there was a political threat, there, and it was related to the crisis in the economy. It was related to the war itself, uh, because the war, you know, was sometimes so terrible, you know, with Nazism and so on, you know, and fascism during the between two war periods, that actually capitalist classes had to yield, and they had no choice for political reason, okay? And so, so it's, uh, the war economy was also completely organized economy, okay? 70% of investment in the war were financed by the state in the United States. And uh, this is called GOPO, okay? Government or privately operated, we, we brought a huge amount, you know, on this type of issues. So, so yes, the, the, it's not simply World War II, okay? It's depression, it's a political li life and so on. It's a, a, a transformation of all, all the, this story about the this project of radically transforming society, which finally failed, okay? Because of what happened in USSR and you know, in China, you know? But which was, during this period, absolutely crucial. And now, White and Bukulola, no, no we, we did not really work uh, on contradiction with, within popular classes, okay? Uh, because, you see, we use the word popular classes to simplify. Because we already have a, a social structure with three classes, okay? Capitalists, the managers, you know, and what we call popular classes, and we don't want to enter into 
but they exist, obviously, because you have segments which come from the only production worker, you have white collars and so on. So, well, we, it's perfectly true that we could work on that, but we don't, okay? <laughs> it, could be, it could be important for political reasons. For example, now, if there is an emergence of new... But you see, I want to be a little more optimist. W recently, when I was in the US, and I will be in the US n next week, uh, my friend there told me, you don't understand that there are really new groups which, uh, which are appearing now. These groups, uh, social groups, who are they? They are managers in a sense, in our sense, you know, but at not at the top, L like professor, like people working and for the government and things like that. And they are developed, becoming very critical of what is going on. Very critical of what is going on, of course, with Trump. Very critical with what is going on with, uh, <coughs> with uh, neoliberalism, with the management of corporations, with the new policy, the new politics outside, okay? And uh, uh, of course, you know, also global warming and all that. And there is a group of people there, kind of professor, kind of uh, people uh, working in the government. Th these people live well, okay? They are new, we discuss that in the book too. And they have new, rather progressive ideas. More, we believe that within popular classes, I'm very sorry for that, but it's like that, okay? And there is a reason why the new, so-called new populism has so much success now. So what I said could look very pessimistic, but maybe you have new groups which are emerging now, and this is what we analyze in the last book in the sense of contradiction, which is within management itself, within the upper fraction, which are very close to capitalist classes now, and the lower fraction, which are very worried about what is happening in, in, in the world now. So maybe we don't have to be completely uh, pessimistic, you know, in this respect, but we don't see that really within the contradiction within what we call, you know, uh, popular classes, which is very easy, you know, because we want to avoid to enter into that. Now, <coughs> now the, mm, well, the problem of uh, the good uh, uh, new accounting, the, the project, you know, of trying to articulate, you know, various classes, inequalities, and so on, various groups in national, it's a very good project, okay? But the problem is that accountings are not compatible with dialectics, okay? And here we are really dealing with things which, uh, I mean by dialectics, things which are ambiguous in nature, okay? If I had more time, I could, I would love, you know, to speak of Marx and Hegel because I'm completely fascinated by Hegel. Okay, that I study very carefully. But accountings are not compatible with, with dialectics in the sense that we believe that we have now hybrid uh, uh, relations of production. In one way, they are capitalist, the other way, they are managerial, and so on. But there is no way to, 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 to cut somewhere. You cannot do accounting on that, okay? Because you're, so we are sure when you find dividends, you say capitalist in a sense. But now even workers receive dividends through their pension fund and so on. So we are in the completely hybrid structure. And the comparison, which we develop a lot in the book with the transition between feudalism and capitalism, is extremely important to understand the nature of this type of transformation. Because, for example, if you take the, what we call in France the Ancien Régime, but you have exactly the same story in England, you can see you know, that the, the nobility, is, they are becoming entrepreneurs. Okay? And the, 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 uh, the, uh, in the other side, the new industry, the new capitalists, they are integrating themselves into the nobility. They, they, they have they wed the weddings between the son of a rich family and so on, and the daughter and so on. And people in France, they change their name, okay? They buy a, a, a new industrial class, you know, they buy land and so on. And they add to their name, nanana, de something, and then, you know, the name of the place and so on. So if you study uh, social relationship in the Ancien Regime, you see exactly this dialectic, which is that it becomes almost impossible to strictly separate between the capitalist class and the old nobility because there is what we call, you know, in our work, in our book, we call a kind of merger at the top, okay? 
you cannot do accounting on that. You can do a kind of sociology. The only way is to understand in the Hegelian way or in the Marxist way the process, which is a process of transformation. Because you must not abandon the distinction between the two types of social relations because of their hybrid uh, character. Okay? You must not, because finally, our society became capitalist. Because finally, our society will become managerial. Despite neoliberalism, despite the manager the, 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 at the top, this is our fundamentalist view, fundamentalist revisionist view of history in a Marxian sense. Marx understood that for uh, the transition between feudalism and capitalism. He had some understanding, because in volume three of Capital, you have this incredible analysis of managers in Marxist capital. But Marx stopped because he was afraid because he understood that he was losing <coughs> the proletarian revolution. And politically, he did not want to, want to do that. Okay, we have just uh, 15 minutes left, but uh, we have a few questions. But the questions are too good, okay? So, so <laughs> I cannot resist. Um, hi, thank you for the presentation. My name is Luisa. I'm from the development track, and I'm from Brazil also. Also, a lot, huh? Um, yeah. <laughs> I just spent, you know, three weeks. Every year I go to Brazil. I'm just back from three weeks, you know, to Brazil. Okay, great. So uh, my question is Brazil. in that direction. <laughs> uh? um, you mentioned a little bit about Latin America, and um, I would like to... It's not the focus of your paper, so I don't know how much you could expand on that. But I would be interested in um, seeing how you understand the recent shifts in, in um, distribution trends in Latin America. Because... As you, you said before, that it would be a kind of um, hybrid between the previous mode of production and the new mode of production. But at the same time, in the last, uh, not, not more recently, but in the 2000s mainly, we had a dis uh, shift in distribution that never happened before. So then we had distribution towards the uh, lowest part of the popular classes. But then the new researches by Pikachu and his groups also show that the top incomes did not really lose a share of, of total income. They were rather stable. And I would like to know from you, and, and the same not only in Brazil, but in Mexico, in uh, Chile, and other countries. So I'd like to know for y from you, how do you understand this? And how do you understand the balance of power within the upper classes? And yeah, your interpretation on, on these trends. How you understand the balance of power between the upper classes, so the uh, managers mm -hmm. and the capitalists in, in Latin America, and if it's really just something in between what was before and what's new, and then if that's the case, why then we had such a different trend more recently? Um, yeah, that's it. Hello, mm, my name is uh, Tore. I'm from Germany and from the development track. Um, and I originally had another question, but I would, would like to follow up on your comments on the progressive socialist democratic movement in uh, the USA, because you mentioned that, and it's kind of linked to I, that I don't understand your definition of, a, uh, of what a manager is, because as you just mentioned it, you see it as like a, the progressive ideas of like a managerial class of professors and highly intellectual people, that was how I understood it uh, in your comment before, um, that they are the root of the progressive movement in the Democratic uh, Party now. And because uh, I think that like a lot of the progressive ideas in the Democratic Party right now are sourced from crowdfunding ideas and actual working class people who are now running for government through different modes of financial possibilities that they uh, organize and um, yeah that would be m my question like what your definition there is because uh, I, I think I did not understand quite and previously I asked about uh, the depreci uh, depreciation allowances and maybe you could I'm sorry <laughs> uh, touch on that again. <laughs> I forgot you know Yeah, my name is Philip. I'm also from Germany and also studying the development track. So it's really Germany, and Brazil. Brazil. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, the two biggest groups in the cohort, I mm -hmm. think. <laughs> um, yeah, so thanks a lot for your presentation. Um, uh, 
um, from my understanding, you really framed the transformation from capitalism to managerialism at the firm level. Um, As a what? At, at the firm level S of like um, kind of giving the theory of the firm like a new relevance in order to mm -hmm. understand what's what's happening mm -hmm. uh, at, in that transformation. And um, uh, yeah, so going back to the yes from, from how I understand how big um, US um, uh, corporations that are listed work, um, uh, is that the, the, the board of directors um, nominates the CEOs and the managers and like the top managers and also determines um, their wages, their yeah, exorbitantly high wages. So um, yes, given that, I wonder like, is there an alliance between, um, let's say the, 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 the managers, the CEOs and the, the board of directors and what is the relationship to the shareholders and also, um, uh, um, how can we understand the heterogeneity of um, big corporations in the US, especially since there are public or open um, corporations that um, raise funds through shareholder and also others that um, are closed? Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, another one? No, no, no. we have three. Okay. Uh, well, I'm very interested in, in Brazil, but you see, it's really another story. So, so true, you know, uh, uh, as you know, as you said, you know, there was some progress of the purchasing power situation of the lower classes because of the policy, uh, of the polit uh, policy and policies the, of Lula. Okay, and this is what was not on the edge in the recent elections because even poor people who benefited from. As uh, these new uh, sources of income did not really acknowledge that this was due to Lula himself. Okay, this is what I was told in, in, told in Brazil. Okay, but uh, you see, um, uh, yes, Brazil uh, has the richest billionaires, you know, in the world on, on the other side, and this is the, the completely conflicting character of this uh, story. Uh, n now, what can be the dynamics of a society like this? Uh, you see, with the result of the elections, okay, which is that finally we we have this new terrible, you know, government uh, in the country, okay, and uh, Bolsonaro and uh, all that, because we are in a in the past, of course, there were more, at least, you know, with Lula, there was some view of a possible progress, you know, of some kind of left and so on, which benefited. But finally, I think that socially it was some kind of success, but finally, politically, it was a failure in the sense that it was not really a knowledge for what it was. And now we are really in the new trends which are in the world, which are economic strength in the sense of rising inequality in the sense of uh, always riches, richer and richer you know billionaires you know and uh, but but su simultaneously there is no re relation of political power you know the story about religion and the story about uh, evangelism you know in the country how they are gaining you know an in absolutely incredible uh, power on the society and so on and so pff, I, you know probably better the story that I know when I go to, to, to Brazil, I said I'm just uh, back for three weeks there. I try to discuss with other people to understand exactly what's going on. And I have often, you know, very diverging, you know, but it, it's terrible. It's really terrible. We have the, this uh, setback, you know, like in France, there is no more left, okay? There is no more uh, political parties in the left. And uh, I said, you know, you are not very lucky to be in this period, you know. Well, better to be students in the 1960s, uh, but okay. The uh, chance that you have is that your life is in front of you. Okay, N now the, 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 the question about uh, uh, boards of, uh, of directors. Well, that's uh, something that we studied a lot, and there is one chapter in the book on this topic, and it's related to the problem of the, uh, the, the leadership of the financial managers. And we have a concept which is interface between uh, uh, the financial institution and financial managers and other managers and you are. And with neoliberalism, there were huge transformations, huge transformations that we analyze because there is a lot, uh, a lo there is a lot of studies, you know, by often sociologists and so on that we use, okay, to show 
that actually with uh, neoliberalism, you, you see what was uh, called, you know, in the, what is still called, you know, interlock directories. Okay, during the post-war period, you had the manager, industrial manager, I would say, you know, which were uh, within various boards of directors and so on. And the new configuration with the, 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 position, the, the position of financial manager completely destroys these relationships, completely destroys that. And now the big financial manager are sitting in sometimes 40 uh, different uh, boards of directors with huge... Uh, uh, salaries, of course, you know, and they are controlling and they really try to cut off all kind of uh, interlocked, uh, interlocked uh, uh, directories, you know, at the lower level, which is not controlled by that. And this is much less developed, apparently, in Germany than in the United States or in the rest of the world. And maybe this is, uh, of course, related to the specific features of Germany and, uh, and so on. And if you read the book, you will see that actually in the study that we use to analyze this type of relationship between financial directors and other, uh, other managers, that actually in this study you can see something that maybe you know if you don't know it, read it, that you have two Germanys. Okay. All countries, for example, in the diagram that which are made by the econo physicist, you have one France, you have one Spain, okay, and so on, one England, but two Germanys. And this is a key feature, in our opinion, to the understanding of what Germany is about. You have a financial Germany and you have an industrial Germany. And the, the of course, and it's probably transforming itself, but this you have to study uh, uh, yourself, okay? And so, yes, we studied that very carefully. We studied the transformations, you know, of the hierarchy and the mechanism that I cannot summarize completely, but there is one chapter in the book of that, and in other works uh, before. Mm. Pardon? Ah oui, la question. Ah, Excusez-moi, j'avais encore oublié. <laughs> well, we you know that uh, uh, corporations or firms in general, you know, have to, in their accounting, they calculate depreciation allowances, which means that, for example, you have a machine and you have to compute that every year the, uh, this machine then loss, uh, mm, there is a loss of maybe 10% of its value. Okay, this is called depreciation allowances, okay? And you have to subtract that from your profits because you, you, your profits are supposed to allow for the reproduction of your capital in a Marxist uh, formulation, okay? If you, if you buy a machine and you, you believe that all the money going on is a profit, you are wrong. You have to allow for the depreciation of the, mo uh, of the machine because at the end, after 10 years, you will have to buy a new machine without increasing your productive power. And this is called depreciation. And it's a huge problem because uh, depreciation are kind of a lump sum, you know, allowances which are calculated like 10% every year, okay? And of course, it's controlled by, uh, it's linked to taxes, you know, because it's a deduction from profit and so on. So in national accounting framework, uh, like NIPA or like uh, f what was called floor funds uh, accounts, uh, uh, you, you have two calculations, two calculations, one calculation allowances as they are made by, uh, by firms and you have other uh, economic allowances that they recalculate themselves. But all these calculations are wrong, okay? Uh, and so uh, when we work on national accounting, we have to redo the calculation because well, you will read that one day, okay? It was I clear in my answer to your question yeah. of what they are they, okay? Do you want to touch up on the U.S. part of my question? Uh, yeah, we, and so the, uh, okay, no, no, uh, yeah, yeah, that's yes, very important. I don't know how I forgot that. Okay, no, we, managers, you see, like all classes, uh, are a new class, okay? But in this new class, you have, of course, fractions, okay? For example, if I say the capitalist classes, you could ask me, the owner of the store, here at the corner, is he a capitalist or not? I mean, 
now, you know, the owner of people, extremely uh, billionaires and so on, are capitalists. So if you approach a class, you always have a hierarchy, okay? Very important hierarchy. So in the managerial class, it's exactly the same thing as in capitalism, okay? Which is that there is a hierarchy of managers, okay? So you have upper fraction, like people who are at the top of big corporation and receive like, uh, uh, what is his name, uh, Gon Gonsari in now in jail, you know, in Japan. Uh, a, a, you have big, really big manager and you have also small managers. So where is uh, the frontier? This goes from people who are making, you know, one million uh, dollar a month to, to university professor, to professors, you know, where do you put the limit? Okay, you understand what I'm trying to say is that the category of manager is a very broad category with a huge hierarchy, okay? So when he, on my comment on the politics in the US, I was referring to lower groups, okay? And with also specific features. So in a sense, it, it's almost impossible to tell exactly where is the frontier, okay, between, between managers and other or popular classes, other salaried workers. It's exactly the same story that in capitalism, because you have some kind of a continuous, you know, alliance and it's very difficult to define, to, to posit a frontier somewhere. So in my comment on the politics in the US, I was referring to low, lower fractions of managers. And these lower fractions are not only lower, but also in their work, they have specific features. For example, they work in the public sector, so they are professors, or they are, okay, so they are not big financial managers, okay? But in a sense, they are not popular classes. These people have, uh, live uh, in a rather good way, maybe, you know, and they have wages. Do you understand my answer now? I'm not sure. Okay, I, I will try to, to summarize, okay? In a class, you have upper and lower fractions, okay? Why are professors including managers? I think that's... No, I'm speaking in particular of university professors, yes. Yes. Because we use managers in a very broad sense, which is ref uh, uh, in relation to the notion of managerial capitalism in the U.S. In the U.S., historically, you will see the references in the book, there is a huge literature on managerial capitalism, okay, with a huge of managers. But now, if you go to, um, the word managers is used in many, many different senses, which has nothing to do with management, really, okay? Because words are used uh, like this, and uh, uh, I don't know, in, in New York, for example, you, you call what is in French, you know, a concierge, okay? Uh, I don't know if you understand French, you know? It, it's called a super in New York. Why? Because it's a superintendent. This is the guy who takes the garbage out of the buildings, okay? Uh, it, it's called the super. Manager is the same story. It has absolutely no meaning. Okay, manager is exactly the same story. In big uh, uh, stores, you know, like, like this, people are using managers in a certain way. And we, this has nothing to do with, uh, it's not at all the managerial class, okay? So we take the word manager, like cadre in French, okay? In a certain sense, which is related to the notion, which has, is a crucial notion in the US of managerial capitalism, which means the develop, you have capitalist owner on one side and other group of people who is in charge of the management of firm, who are in charge of the controls of the means of production. And this is the way Marx analyzes this thing. So, so you see, we have no other words, okay? I believe that university professor, I think it's sociologically as a good idea to classify them as lower fraction of the managerial class. Because the manager, they are manager within firms, they are also in the government sector, but they have also the monopoly of thinking, the monopoly of writing, you know. The, these people are... Uh, I don't think that they have the monopoly on thinking and writing, uh, and I think... I think they play absolutely crucial role in, 
in newspaper, in books, and so on. There are very few, few actual, pop there are, you know, popular contribution, but there are not so many. I mean, if you look sociologically, I think a lot of the capability to speak on radio, the capability to write, the capability to publish is concentrated within this type of a social categories. It doesn't mean that other people don't do it, you know. I'm just speaking now of broad masses, you know. I think they have a particular role which is very important in society. You cannot deny that. But it doesn't question the fact that, of course, you know, all group, everybody can even become a manager in this sense, okay. So, so we use uh, the word managers in, in, a, in a sense which is a result of the way it is used with a lot of ambiguities. Now the question of frontier, in particular lower frontier, la is also a difficult question. And this is more sociological. There you have to uh, look at the relationship to the means of production, but you also have to look to knowledge. You have to look to capability to communicate, to capability to publish, to capability to think. Okay. Four minutes after half past, but we also started a little bit late. So if you're willing, there are still two more questions. If you are also interested in the answer, or we empower you. Or you do it after class. I think it's lunch time because they don't have more questions. No, no there, there's two more questions actually. Two more questions, but, uh, okay. It depends. Like if you're willing to, to, to go for this, then mm -hmm. I would say let's do it. If not, then we can also just stop here. Okay. Okay. Uh, hello, my name is Yannick. I'm from Germany and I'm studying the development ah, option. You too. Speeding <laughs> <laughs> Sp a little bit up. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, sorry. Um, so actually, I was um, so going on from the fact that uh, inequality is driven uh, rather by uh, the rise of top wages than by the uh, rise of profits and that we have now a new class, the managerial class. I was wondering uh, what is the implication for our usage of the wage share? So for example, if we think of uh, measuring inequality by the wage and the profit share, uh, maybe we have to rethink that then, or if we think of um, uh, growth theory, where we also argue with the wage share, but does the wage share now also contains the manager wages? And yeah, what, what are the implications for that? Okay. So I'm waiting for the other question. Hello, my name is Isabel. I am from Ecuador, ah. Latin America. Yeah, <laughs> different yeah. one. Uh, I am from the uh, option A, knowledge and uh, innovation policies track. Mm -hmm. uh, I was wondering, what do you think in the role of the state? Uh, the role of what? The state. The state. Mm -hmm. And the uh, institutions in maybe enhancing this managerial classes power in a sense and also how it relates to the different, different capitalisms. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> okay, should I answer? Yep. Yeah. Rapidly. So, first the wage share. No, the wage share is not a good uh, indication of uh, inequalities, okay? Uh, because, you see, this is related to what I said about the new uh, inequality accounting, distributional accounting, and so on. Because you see, it's, for example, I in the paper, you can look at the paper, there is a figure about dividends. Okay? And uh, dividends are paid by firm. Dividends go to, to, to families, okay? to, to people, and so on. But in between, Half of the dividend are lost. Lost where? In the financial system and so on. It's very complex and so on. So, so if you take the category of national accounting, okay, we, we discuss that in the appendix of the book, and you say, okay, I have the wage share. It doesn't tell you really the distribution of income in society. Okay? Because uh, what happened with profits is too complex and uh, of course you have taxes and so on and then what's considered as profit they go through channels you know and they go to no if you really the wage share is not a good uh, a good variable to study inequalities okay 
Uh, we, there is at least one page of that in the book, in the, in the paper, not in the book. Okay. And so uh, you need to, to go deeper than that. You need to see the channels and so on. And now, state, yes, we believe that there are managers in the s in the within the government institutions, okay? And sociolog sociolog sociologically, there is, of course, a link between private and public managers and so on. There is a movement uh, there, okay? So it's uh, a, a the role of the state, you know, is... You we did not study, you know, various groups within popular classes, but the relationship between public and private managers is extremely important, and we studied that a lot. For example, you know, in the during the, the great every structural crisis, each structural crisis, the role of public manager becomes uh, very important. For example, in the Great Depression, you have the New Dealers. Okay, so it's not private; the private management, which actually transform, you know, conducted the policy in the U.S. during wars and during structural crisis, the role of public manager becomes absolutely central, generally in alliance with private managers like in the New Deal, okay, the New Dealers. And uh, of course, you know, in the case of the New Deal, the distance with uh, capitalist classes was also huge. Uh, but in, 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 for example, in the la latest uh, structural crisis, which has to uh, 2007 and 2008, okay, 10 years ago. Uh, and then, of course, the role of a public manager was crucial, okay, too, in particular because you have all these institutions of ma related to the management of the macroeconomy, which are huge institutions uh, with economists, but with uh, people in the government and so on, nationally and internationally. And as is always the case, they took the control of the situation. But after they lose the control of the situation, that's exactly what is happening uh, now. So yes, uh, 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 for example, in the book, we have a chapter on that. And we show you know, what people don't know usually, which is how big the government is in the United States. In the United States, the government is much larger than in France, even in terms of percentages of uh, added value, okay? You have 40, I don't remember, 44% of the, for the income of the government in the United States of total added value, but you see, in France you have 54% maybe, but the difference is huge because you see in the US, the retirements are not part except uh, public retirements, okay, but I'm speaking of private retirements, they are not part of government expenses, while in France they are part of government expenses, and this is huge, okay. Now we also have a, a huge a public social security, as we call, you know, system for health insurance and so on. So if you calculate all that, the government, the size of the government in terms of percentages of total income is much larger in the United States than in France, okay. So, so yes, of course, you know, public, the public as aspect is a very, very important aspect, not only in a quote-unquote socialist country, as people from the right say in the US when they consider France, but you see, even in the United States, I mean, the, the, the government component is absolutely huge. This is a characteristic. Uh, you, you have the managerial revolution at the transition between the 19th and the 20th century, and you have what we call the government revolution. The government revolution begins somewhere in 1920 and so on. Huge step forward during the Great Depression, then World War II, and then it goes on after World War II. And now it's more or less flat, you know, in a sense. You have a nice uh, picture uh, of that in the book. Okay.